we're talking about in the red China. That's right, enter Evergrande, a company that's lived up to its name in both its astronomic rise and catastrophic collapse. Now, if you, like me, follow Chinese monetary policy, the situation we're in today is about as shocking as the bad guy dying at the end of a Bond film. <gasps> what a twist! Now, for a little background, in the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2008, Beijing and Washington took exact opposite approaches towards the recovery. In America, we had a stunted and choppy recovery, leaving much to be desired when another collapse came around in 2020. On the other side of the ocean, though, China's leaders had a different take on the 2008 recovery plans. A massive unleashing of credit growth back then led to unused infrastructure, ghost towns, excess industrial capacity, and an overhang of debt. You want to build the world's biggest ghost town in the middle of the desert? Well, here's a blank check. Tell you what, let's recreate Paris in the middle of nowhere. If they ever get to making 28 months later, we'll have the abandoned city waiting. Basically, unlike in America, where things remained pretty tight and recoveries were slow, in a post-2008 China, cash was pretty much free. And if you had an idea, no matter how dumb, well, you could borrow a ton of money to fund it. Based on that information, it's probably no surprise that Evergrande is a property developer. More specifically, Evergrande has the distinction of being the world's most debt-saddled property developer. Oh, you bet those guys were getting loans to build all sorts of properties in the middle of nowhere. Now we've got 3 billion people in this country, I'm sure a few of them are going to make their way out there. Now unfortunately, this if you build it they will come business model didn't exactly go to plan. It does not look like these investment properties generate much cash. Take for example Evergrande's plan to build a replica New York in the rural area of Tianjin. Now if you guys heard that New York was dead, take a trip out there and then give me a call. The Economist recently profiled Tianjin, which boasted the slowest GDP growth amongst the Chinese provinces and an office vacancy rate in its latest financial district of just under 70%. 70% empty units is not a recipe for business success if you're the building's developer. Now, by the way, that report was from the pre-COVID boom year of 2018. So what do you do when you take out a bunch of cheap loans to build buildings in the middle of nowhere and you now find yourself the proud owner of a bunch of built buildings in the middle of nowhere? While there are several reasonable business options out there that make decent sense, or you could go full Ponzi scheme on investors. Evergrande, well, they chose the latter route. All right, we owe a bunch of cheap money, but we aren't making the money we need to pay back those cheap loans from our huge uninhabited properties. Tell you what, if you give us slightly more expensive loans, we'll use that money to pay back the cheap loans. And now we're cooking with gasoline. Just keep moving your debt from one credit card to another and slightly higher interest rates all the time, all the while claiming that you're making this revenue from your abandoned properties and other investments. Uh oh. Eventually, you end up in 2019 taking out short term loans at between 8 and 9.5% interest just to keep this thing going. Now, the argument Evergrande would make against this characterization of their business model is that they're holding the properties for capital appreciation. This would partially explain their low yields and why some properties, such as the Splendor Tianjin, part of that fake New York we talked about, are still on the books. Basically, sure Shanghai is hot right now, but as soon as the city folk find out that they can live next to the replica Eiffel Tower, well, we're going to be jacking up rents and making a small fortune. You're going to want to be the guy who lent us the money to tide us over then. Now, unfortunately, this business model can only go on so long. The company has started to pay overdue bills by handing over unfinished property. Don't be surprised if you turn on the TV soon and see something like this. So, okay, 
a huge construction company with properties that could be incredibly valuable if anybody valued them, might be going out of business soon. Why is this rocking the world economy? I mean, all things considered, it seems as though they'd lift off the map relatively nicely. Well, remember how I said that they're the world's most debt-saddled property developer? Turns out, that's quite the accomplishment. They owe so many people so much money that if their debts suddenly become worthless, that could be a threat to the Chinese and potentially the world's economy. Can't pay back a million dollar loan? Well, you're a bad businessman who deserves to be put out of business. Can't pay back more than $300 billion? Congratulations, you're systemically important as a businessman. Now, $300 billion is a ton of assets to have suddenly disappear from the economy. So what, if anything, do you do? To understand China's bailout conversation, we need to change our paradigm a bit. Remember how in 2008's recovery, America was being super stingy while China opened up the funding taps? Well, now it's the exact opposite. The American Federal Reserve is flooding the market with funds while the Chinese Federal Reserve is counting their pennies to make exact change. President Xi Jinping and his team are winding things back to refocus on longer term initiatives to strengthen the technology sector and tamp down on debt risks. That's not great news for the most indebted developer in the world. Loans are not particularly cheap over there right now, so the cost of shifting debt from one guard to the next is getting astronomical. Now, This coupled with an initiative designed to get lenders to stop buying into these unprofitable firms is spelling disaster for Evergrande. Wait, you're telling me we have to make money? And every quarter? Oh man. Now this brings us to the core question facing the Chinese government today. To bail out or not to bail out? Now first the argument against bailing out this company. Now China has been trying to cut down on their cheap debt for years. This isn't the first episode I'd leaned on that in the red China pun in a video. Each time something has ended up coming up that cancels that program, whether it's a trade war or a virus. Borrowing huge sums of money for things like building cities in the middle of nowhere is not a sustainable business model, and as I mentioned earlier, the cost of passing on this debt and maintaining it is getting more and more expensive as China tries to change their policies and tighten things up. A bailout would tacitly condone the type of reckless borrowing that's gotten Evergrande into trouble. Ending moral hazard, a tolerance in business for risky bets and the belief that the state will always bail you out also would make the financial system more resilient over the long run. Now, On the other side of the coin, there are some major advantages to just hitting that snooze button on getting a handle on corporate debt maybe one more time. Now, There are three downside risk factors that China is watching in the lead up to their decision. Social unrest, capital markets, and economic impacts. Now, first, something I never thought I'd say in coverage of a communist country. Think about the property owners. A lot of people's money is on the line here, and that means a lot of angry constituents. Now, it's not just the usual suspects either. You invest in a company that fails, well, that comes with the territory. What's not so simple are hundreds of billions of dollars in potential properties that had been sold to fund manufacturing those potential properties. Basically, I've got a great theoretical condo that I want to put you in. Just imagine the view because I can't show it to you. I haven't built the condo yet. If you buy that condo, I'm going to build the building that it will be a part of and then give it to you. Now, Evergrande has $202 billion in pre-sale liabilities, equivalent to about 1.4 million individual properties that it has committed to completing. For context, 1.4 million is everyone living in Hawaii, or more than the entire population of Seattle. That's a lot of people to have united in anger against a company, or worse, government inaction. 
Now in Guangzhou, home buyers have actually surrounded a local housing bureau to demand that Evergrande restart stalled construction. That social unrest does not look great for Xi Jinping. A similar worry is that if Evergrande had to substantially dump their buildings onto the open market in order to pay down some of these debts, that could have a huge impact on real estate in China, beyond just their holdings. Now, If Evergrande had to dump its inventory onto the market, it would drag down property prices substantially. Without a social safety net and with limited places to put their money, Chinese savers have, for years, been encouraged to buy homes whose prices were only ever supposed to go up. Today's real estate accounts for 40% of household assets. Arrows start pointing in the wrong direction and that has a very substantial impact on the wealth of normal Chinese citizens. Now, the next threat goes a bit beyond individuals losing their money. What if the system loses its money? A bunch of banks either owe a lot of money to Evergrande or own a bunch of real estate backed securities. Now, this is where you get comparisons between the developers collapse and Lehman Brothers in 2008. The Lehman Brothers collapse ended a long running game of financial hot potato. Everyone was selling and buying each other's assets for cash. Suddenly, no exchanges. What you have in your hand is what you're working with. If you got a lot of real estate holdings and no cash, well, good luck to you. Your depositors are going to start pulling out their money and you won't have the cash to pay them. Looks like you're going to have to dump some of your holdings onto the open market in order to scrape together the cash to make payments and make ends meet. Now, when a bunch of banks that are holding all of these hot potatoes have to dump their investments at the same time to get cash to pay people pulling their money out of their accounts, well, that's going to cause the market to plummet and get a bunch of bankruptcies to emerge. In the aftermath of the Lehman Brothers collapse, the Federal Reserve stepped in and directly bought a bunch of these distressed assets for cash. Let's not flood the open markets with all these new asset sales right now. How about we just make it an A to B transaction? Today, in a not so great sign for Evergrande's future, the Chinese government just preemptively stepped in and preemptively started to buy assets from banks in China. China warned banks that Evergrande will not be able to pay back debt obligations, and the Chinese central bank has just moved to avoid a liquidity crisis by injecting $14 billion into the country's banking system. With the government open to buying some of these distressed assets for cash, well, that fun game of financial hot potato should be able to keep going, with banks being able to stay solvent in this bad situation. But let's not buy so many assets that they start lending to Evergrande Capital again. The last potential concern for China is something that might answer an earlier question as well. Why build massive cities in the middle of nowhere? Well, a long term slowdown in property construction, an industry that represents about a fifth or a quarter of China's economy by most estimates, would cause a significant decline in GDP growth and commodity demand in China. Basically, in China, forget infrastructure week, it's been infrastructure decade. With access to all the cheap cash you could want from the central bank, sure, take out a loan and build a bridge to nowhere. The government won't object because it looks like growth. For years, high GDP growth has ensured local officials' promotions within the Chinese Communist Party. In the case of the faltering Manhattan replica of Yu Jiapu, oh hey, welcome back to the show, fake Manhattan. It helped boost Tianjin's GDP growth rate to about 16% for three years the fastest in China at the time. and That helped former Tianjin member Zhang Gao Li get promoted to Vice Premier of China. Now, In Zhang's rearview mirror on his way to Beijing, there was a failed project in mountains of debt. So if construction companies start failing, well, that's going to have a huge impact on China's GDP growth and employment numbers. That Taj Mahal in the middle of the Gobi Desert isn't going to generate billions in GDP growth by building itself. Now, With those factors in mind, you can probably start to understand the concern that this house of cards might be falling apart. 
Today, investors the world over are wondering, will the Chinese government keep Evergrande from going under? And if they don't, will that lead to asset devaluations and liquidity problems spanning the entire globe? Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.